Liliana, I think you're muted. Thank you, Professor. Yes, I was muted with this uh, mute all uh, option. So uh, I would like to say hello to everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining uh, for one more week of the Belgrade Sports Medicine Forum. Uh, to date with us, we have a great name of the sports medicine, Professor Roland Barr. Uh, Professor Barr is from Oslo and he is uh, currently the head of Aspetar Sports Injury and Illness Prevention Program, but also the professor of sports medicine and the chair of the Oslo Trauma Research Center and Norwegian School of Sports Sciences, chief, of medical, uh, chief medical officer and department chair of Olympia Toppen and Department of Sports Medicine at Norwegian Olympic <laughs> Training Center in Oslo. He is a scientific researcher that has been situated up uh, to actually more than 35,000 times until now. A fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine, member of the International Olympic Committee of uh, Medical Commission, member of Medical Commission of the International Volleyball Federation, and editor-in-chief of two really important uh, books that are published by the International Olympic Committee, Manual of Sports Injuries and Handbook of Sports Injuries Prevention. Uh, today, Professor Barr will hold the lecture under the title, The Norwegian Olympics and Paralympics Screening and Monitoring Program. What is it? Why do we do it? And does it help Norway win the medals? Uh, so, in this moment, we have around 40 participants. I will uh, going to mute the microphones of the ones that are getting in uh, later. So, without further delay, Professor, you have the main words to start with today's lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Biliana. I'm uh, sorry to not be in lovely uh, Serbia uh, with you, uh, but instead, I guess we're sharing the same fate of uh, being locked down wherever we are. Uh, fortunately, it seems to be going quite well in Norway, so uh, we have more freedom now than we had over the last uh, couple of months. Uh, so let me just uh, let me just share my uh, my screen here. Okay. Do you emphasize from the start that this presentation is not a one-man job. Um, I, I've added Ben Clarsen on the title slide. He has been instrumental in setting up the program I will discuss. And as you will see, our entire team is involved in the project. So if I accidentally say I during this presentation, it should be we. And in truth, most of the times it should be they. But let me begin by describing who we are. So the Norwegian sports model is unique in that all of Norwegian sports, amateur, able-bodied, disabled, professional, is united in one governing. And as you can say, see, the name is gets quite long. But Olympia Toppen is like the Olympic Committee, except it's the operative department for esports development in our elite sports model. Uh, okay. Uh, just. Okay. Uh, okay, Professor. For some reason, the the slides have stopped. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. They're back now. And if we ask ourselves. How translates to elite sports and particularly focus on health aspects, we have said health is a prerequisite for quality of life and for performance. But if you spend a minute thinking about this value set, uh, I think most people see health and sports as overlapping entities. Think of the extremely fit athletes. But the question is, how much do the value sets 
underpinning these two entities overlap, really. If you first take medicine or health, it is about wellness, it's about functionality, it is about disease prevention. Whereas if we look at sport, especially elite sports, it's about winning, it's about competitiveness, it's about performance, it's about entertainment, and it may be argued that there's actually no overlap between the two. So for the medical department or the department of sports medicine at Olympia Toppen, what we have uh, communicated very clearly is that the first and foremost responsibility of our department is the long-term health of the athlete. This should weigh more than winning medals in the short term. And that our primary motivation should be the health of the athlete, not performance. In other words, we cannot be the athlete's fan. There are enough people focusing on the performance aspects of science. Our main role, or one of our main roles, is to balance this out by arguing uh, the health uh, aspects when difficult decisions need to be made. The expectations are clear. We are to deliver top quality services, diagnosis and treatment. We need to be accessible, easily available for the elite athletes. We need to be able to work in teams, cross-disciplinary, and we need to have uh, good access to an internal national network uh, that we can consult with when needed. The main role of the department as such is to provide optimal medical treatment for today's and tomorrow's elite athletes, as well as focus on working interdisciplinary to prevent injury and illness. This is the staff. Um, it looks like a lot of people, but when you do the math, this uh, equates to five full-time physicians uh, working in our team. Uh, these are the physical therapists, and again, it's about five uh, full-time physicians, um, which means that we do have a lot to do. I'd like to especially highlight two of the members of this team. One is Ben Clarsen, as mentioned before, and the other is Lars Haukot, who is currently the project manager for the screening and monitoring project in our department. And it's important again to reiterate, everyone in the department is involved in this program as we speak. The medical department scope is Olympia top athletes. These are uh, people, uh, athletes who already have shown uh, medal potential in Olympic games and such. But we're also open to all other national team athletes, senior and junior, as well as athlete students at elite sports high school. So we are operating as a normal medical clinic, if you like, for the athlete group. But we also have the specific tasks of following up our scholarship athletes. Uh, these are the Olympia top athletes and especially Olympic Paralympic candidates, as well as lead the medical team for Olympics, Paralympics and other, uh, other many multi-sports events that are being organized these days. So what are the challenges in providing medical support to an Olympic uh, and Paralympic team? Well, first of all, we have lots of small teams. We're not a big country, so we might sometimes have a team of one athlete in one sport who, is, who can compete at the elite level. Our athletes live all over the world and they travel constantly. Uh, there are a few sports that have year-round medical coverage. The Federation simply cannot afford to have a medical team uh, uh, in place. And many of our best athletes relate to multiple medical providers. Imagine someone who is a professional cyclist living in France, but also with a home in Norway. Uh, he relates maybe to us, to the national team, uh, doctor and physio, to his professional club team. Uh, and may also have a, a, a local family physician in uh, Monaco or wherever he lives. This is a challenge for communication between medical providers. And we have learned that athletes can be slow in reporting new health problems. This sometimes results in problems being under the radar uh, and without a clear management plan. 
This slide illustrates the, the challenge uh, with organization and with providing medical care. So this actually depicts uh, the candor teams for the Pyeongchang Olympic Games and Paralympic Games. And as you can see from the symbols here, these are the teams that actually do have a team physio or a team doctor hired by the federation or organized by their own federation. So what we need to do to provide care for all of these athletes is go in with resources from our medical department and assign the responsibility for each of these teams who do not have their own medical support. We typically begin this program um, about two years before uh, every um, Olympic and Paralympic Games. And this starts uh, with medical screening, which is intended to result in an action plan, targeted action plan, and then an injury and illness monitoring program, which I will describe shortly. So in many ways, you could say this is the main tool. This is how we, from Olympic Health Inside, try to support the athletes and the federations uh, during each Olympic cycle, uh, preparing the athletes for the games. This program has been running now uh, since London 2012 and expanded and, uh, and revised along the way. And I will describe our current program uh, in the following slide. What I would like to emphasize first though, before I go into details is that this primarily is a clinical program to optimize athlete health, keep them healthy, and hopefully in that way, win more medals. Uh, under the surface, we also collect data that we use for epidemiological research, but philosophy, the guiding philosophy of the program is that it is not a research project uh, that may or may benefit athletes sometime in the future. Our screening and monitoring program should have direct and immediate benefits for all the stakeholders athletes, medical staff, and coaches. So let's have a look at the program, the way we run it with our Norwegian athletes. First, there's the screening component. And if we go back a little over 10 years, um, this group of experts uh, met in Lausanne uh, to write an IOC consensus statement on the periodic health evaluation of elite athletes or pre-participation examination, if you like. And in this, several reasons outlined for why you may want to perform uh, an examination like this. First, it should be about identifying the high-risk athletes. So the question of looking into the future, who is going to be, who is at risk for injury? The second should be identifying existing problems. So who is injured and ill? What are their problems uh, currently? Third, baseline testing, testing should be valuable to have something to compare to if the athlete is later injured or ill. Fourth, importantly, to review medications and supplements that athletes uh, may be taking and make sure that they're not in conflict with the uh, World Anti-Doping Code. Fifth, to establish the relationship with the athlete, not just the athlete meeting you or you meeting the athlete, but also the athlete getting to know you as a medical provider. And then finally, in some international federations and national organizations, there are legal requirements that athletes pass the medical, uh, so to speak, before they're allowed to perform. So let me first just quickly address the top issue. Is it possible to identify who the high-risk athlete is. So that would be looking into the future using some kind of a test to say, well, your test score uh, puts you at, at a very high risk of uh, getting an injury. And the question is, can we do that better than just flipping a coin? I will not uh, go more into detail on this, but I direct those of you who are interested in that topic uh, to this paper published about four years ago. Uh, where I argue why screening tests to predict injury do not work. And with a sad uh, addition here, and probably never will. So in the Norwegian Olympic Committee, we do not use tests to identify who the high-risk athletes are or try to look into the future. 
but we do the examination to try and identify existing problems among athletes. And of course, health problems do exist. Um, this slide shows uh, non-injury health problems at the time of screening of the Tokyo Olympic team. Um, and as you can see here, uh, nearly half of uh, athletes uh, suffer from some sort of uh, allergy. Uh, Olympic athletes to the to the diagram, you can see that in this group you also have the added burden of chronic disease. Musculoskeletal problems at the time of screening. Basically, half of the athletes present uh, at screening with some and the same of injury problem. And the same applies to the Paralympic uh, athlete population. So screening does detect multiple health problems. Uh, the idea is then to use screening and make sure that they're optimally managed. What about the next issue then, uh, baseline testing? This is an example of an athlete suffering in ACL injury after being screened. Um, and here you see the results from live kinetic knee extension testing and vertical jumps. The intention then is, uh, of course, that the screening examination is followed up with an action plan, um, targeting specific areas that uh, need to be worked on by the athletes, by the medical team, by the coaching team. Um, this clearly is a challenging uh, task uh, because it does uh, require the engagement of so uh, many people, essentially all those working with uh, each athlete. This then brings me to uh, the second part, and that is the monitoring program. So when we've completed the screening, uh, athletes are entered into an injury and illness monitoring program. Um, this is based on the Oslo Sports Trauma Research Center questionnaire on health problems, which we designed uh, a few years ago in order to capture, to be able to capture all types of injury uh, and illness problems uh, in athletes, not just the major ones, those uh, causing time loss from sport and from training. So before I, I describe how, it is important to point out that the program has, has served, is meant to serve two purposes, one on the individual level and one um, on the big picture. So let's call it the team, the team level. On the individual level, the surveillance and monitoring program helps with communication between athletes and their medical staff. It helps identify new problems early and it allows us to monitor known problems, chronic problems that athletes have on how they fluctuate over time. At the big picture level, so that would be the Olympiatoppen level or the team level, we can identify patterns of injuries and illnesses, uh, what, who, when. We can identify areas uh, where we might uh, decide to focus uh, prevention uh, efforts. Um, and we can assess the effect of anything that we do to try and prevent injury and illness in the team. So then let me explain how this is done. Uh, a normal injury and in illness surveillance uh, program uh, is typically done by the athlete reporting to the medical team and then the medical team uh, reporting to the manager or the database uh, collecting uh, overall data for the entire team or a group of team. Now the difference to this uh, program is that weekly their health status to a database. Uh, the medical team is alerted through an online health dashboard um, and are then expected to provide individual follow-up uh, on each problem and at the same time record diagnosis information in the database. Let's have a look at how this looks for the athlete. So every week athletes uh, get an alert on their cell phone 
to respond to four key questions on the consequences of any health problems they may have. These uh, questions focus on sports participation, on training modification, have they had to shift and change their training because of a health problem at any time? Uh, has performance been, uh, been um, uh, affected uh, because of a health problem? And do they have any symptoms to treat pain if it's uh, a question of, uh, of injury? If they have reported a health problem, they will be asked, well, is it an injury or an illness? Um, which region uh, does it affect? What were your symptoms in terms of uh, uh, if, if it's an illness? Uh, is it a new problem? Uh, did you lose any uh, time from uh, training or competition? And who knows about it and any comments? Once the answer is completed, the questionnaire, which goes in, there is an alert sent when a new health problem is, uh, is reported via email or uh, SMS or both uh, to the medical team expected to follow up uh, individually and record the diagnosis in the database. So in Olympitopan, um, we have an overview, we have access to an overview of the health of all um, the athletes uh, on our team. And then each health provider has his or her own team. Um, and you see here the example of five athletes, uh, the colors um, represent tick box represent one week, the colors represents whether the athlete is healthy, shown as green, or injured, uh, shown as yellow, orange, red, or, uh, which indicates the severity uh, of the health problem uh, reported. Um, and if you then click in on uh, any of these athletes, you will get uh, a view like this. So this is an example of an athlete uh, with an overuse injury uh, of the knee. Um, and where the severity of the injury in each of the weeks going back one year is indicated by uh, the height of the, uh, of the green area um, in this diagram. Um, and the team here with multiple health problems uh, suffered uh, by an athlete over the same time period. Um, and you can see a list of all the problems uh, down here. Again, um, giving a detailed overview um, of the status of each athlete on the team. So um, let's have a look at some example data, big picture data on our Olympic impact. And the data I'm about to show to share with you is on our uh, candidates for the Tokyo Games, the Olympic and Paralympic uh, Games, so covering a 16 month period um, until uh, the end of, of last year. And this is obviously an ongoing monitoring um, as the games have now been postponed until uh, 2021. The questions we can ask, the big picture questions that we can ask and answer are questions like how often do our athletes get injured or ill? How much training in, uh, is missed uh, because of injury and illness? How many of our athletes are sick or injured at any given time? and identify the biggest health problems uh, affecting our team or our team. So first, how often do our athletes get sick or injured? Our data show that on average, each of our athletes report five health problems each year, three injuries, and two illnesses. And we obviously also have the ability to look at these data on uh, a team basis. Um, this is one example on the um, because time is limited. Um, I will have to limit myself to overall data uh, for the end of the trip. So the next question is then how much training is missed due to injury and illness? And it turns out that on average, our Olympians and Paralympians lost 34 days last year because of health problems. 34 days of training lost, 26 days on average due to injury, and eight days due to illness. So clearly injuries and illnesses represent a key factor in uh, being able to train and then subsequently being able to perform. 
the next question is uh, how many of our athletes are sacred injured at uh, any given time? Uh, and I uh, underline that this is any uh, health problem, even very minor problems. Uh, so one in three of our athletes have a health problem at uh, any time, mainly due to heart physical complaints and to a lesser degree uh, illness from various from sports to sport. And the final question here is what are the biggest health problems affecting our team? So um, a risk matrix, as shown in this slide, is a good way to um, illustrate which problems are uh, could be the key priority. This then shows the same data for the uh, entire Olympic and Paralympic team. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with these uh, matrices, um, on the vertical axis is a measure of severity. In this case, the average number of time lost days for each of the, uh, of the health problems uh, depicted in the, in, the, in the figure. And on the horizontal axis is the incidence. So how often do these injuries happen? Obviously, the product of severity and incidence is a measure of how important uh, or what the burden of this health problem uh, would be. And that also means that the darker the orange color, the more uh, important uh, is the problem. And overall, you will see that there is one type of injury that, uh, that um, uh, differs from the rest, and that's knee injuries. And the circle shows that this is acute knee injuries. So the by far biggest burden in our Olympic and Paralympic team uh, is of knee injuries. Is from knee injuries. So risk matrices like this can be then be created for each team, uh, each subgroup of athletes, uh, whatever you like, to identify prevention uh, focus areas for prevention. So the question then becomes. What are the critical factors for a program like this uh, to work? The key, one key issue is, of course, response rates. Athletes need to uh, respond. And as you can see, over the period uh, we have just been discussing, the average response rate has been 83%, and currently uh, it sits at 85%, I think, last week. And we're very happy with that. And we have learned by trial and error, I must admit, that technology is critical. It's very simple, really. Everything needs to work every time. And the users, the athletes, and the practitioners have to like the system. And in, in choosing between the carrot and the stick, um, another thing that we've learned is that in order for a system like this to work, it's only a carrot approach that is going to uh, help you. So it's important that rather than being a research project that Olympia Dublin does that may or may not benefit athletes in the future, our monitoring program should have direct and immediate benefits for all stakeholders, athletes, medical staff, and coaches. This cannot be said often enough, also within our team. So the question of the athlete is, what's in it for me? The question of the medical team is the same, what's in it for me? The question the coach asks is, what's in it for me? How is this program going to help us keep our athletes healthy. And the way we try to address those questions is, well, for the athlete, it's better, more timely medical care, perhaps. For the medical team, it helps them do a better job, knowing what the athletes are doing at any time in terms of health problems. Um, and for the coach, it's all about getting more training days, keeping the athletes healthy. Um, and then the final question, which I threw in for fun, I guess, is does it help uh, Norway win medals? So if we go to Create a Sporting Nation, the website that uh, 
uh, poll statistics from all sports, Olympic and uh, non-Olympic sports, it clearly shows that the by far best sporting nation in the world is Nation size into account, we're doing okay, perhaps butting above our weight class. But you might say, well, that's because you do so well in the winter sports. And yes, that is. But if you take a historical perspective on this, this is not necessarily, uh, has not necessarily always been the case. Going back to Torino 2006 and looking at the medal table there, you will see that Norway is all the way down in 13th place with only two gold medals. And as the media like to depict it, illness within the team, perhaps a norovirus um, epidemic, uh, may have been a major contributing uh, factor to Norway not uh, performing as expected during those games. Um, and in fact, 17% uh, of the athletes on the team were ill or injured uh, during games time. If we go to Vancouver 2010, when Ola Rensen was the CMO of the, of the team, we will see that uh, only 5% were ill and Norway climbed on the medal table until fourth place. And then Sochi uh, 2014, second place with a similar uh, number of ir ill and injured athletes. And finally, now in Pyeongchang, uh, keeping that number low and stable, Norway was able to climb into first place. And of course, we were very happy, as were the athletes. And now you ask yourself, well, did we, uh, did we prepare perfectly for those games? Um, and I'll end by showing this video, uh, which was taken during, uh, halfway through the Olympics. The games from the cafeteria at the British Olympic uh, Training Centre, where you can clearly see that the administration had not prepared uh, for any event uh, during the games. I thank you very much for your uh, attention, but I would also like to take this opportunity to invite you. Uh, let me see, Professor, you are muted. Oh. No, yes, I will go and... Okay. And to unmute Professor. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you so much for uh, for today's lecture. Uh, I would like to now ask, ask the audience to uh, ask the questions that you have to Professor. So you have two ways how to do that. If you click on the icon that is uh, participants, uh, the window will show up and in the bottom you have the option raise hand and then I will get the notification that you want to ask uh, a question or you can uh, put the question in, um, in the chat section. Uh, so just before we start with the question, just allow me to say hello to some of uh, the special uh, people in the audience today. So Dr. Vesic, that is director of the anti-doping agency here in Serbia. Uh, Dr. Cirkis, who is the uh, chief of medical team in our athletic, uh, athletic Federation. Professor Sasha Vuban from Nish, uh, he's a professor at the Faculty of Sport uh, and Physical Education. Uh, to uh, the professor, uh, Dr. Evelyn uh, Quidi from Thessaloniki, she's a cardiologist and the chief of sports medicine laboratory in Aristotle University, Thessaloniki. And Milana Mirkovic, who is here from London, so she's a part of the medical team of the Great Britain David Scoop representation to Yotza Nebusha from Qatar and Boyan who is currently in Dubai. So we have really international audience uh, today here. So for the beginning, we have uh, Nikola Topalovic. So he is assistant uh, also at the uh, Department of Physiology where I work uh, and he's a specialist in sports medicine. So uh, Nikola, you can unmute your 
uh, oh, actually you're unmuted, so you can ask question to Professor Barr. Hello to everybody. First of all, I want to thank you for this lecture. It's so nice to have you today with us. Also, I want to thank you to Professor Popovic and Professor Mazic for organizing this e-forum and of course, Bila for perfect leading. Your career is amazing. Uh, it's really amazing what you do for, for your career. And I have actually two questions. First question is, is uh, about uh, injury rate in teenage population. I worked almost four years in child surgery department, child orthopedic department, and I saw a lot of uh, injury of ankle, ACL, uh, hip and spine injury in teenage population of 15, 16, and 17 years old. And that was uh, unimaginable 20 years ago. Uh, because of your long career, I want to ask you, what's the main problem? Is that maybe unprofessional stuff or maybe pressure of parents who push kids to the limits or maybe overload of training session, early specialization, modern artificial surface or altogether? I don't hear you. Uh, Professor, we have a problem hearing you. Really? Um, I'm trying to switch microphones. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, it's much better. It's much better. OK, OK, thank you. Um, Yes, great question. Very difficult to answer. I'm, I'm certain that I cannot answer it uh, because we simply don't have good data. Uh, to do that, we would have to, to, to track uh, sports over the last 20 years uh, to see what changes have, have happened um, and then try to see if there's actually a correlation between those changes that have happened uh, on how sports is being played um, and the injury rates. Uh, but some observations, maybe, um, I, th I, th I think in part you answer the question yourself uh, by mentioning all those factors which could play a role. Um, one of them is, is certainly that, uh, at least in, in Norway uh, and, and possibly in Serbia as well, training uh, starts at a younger age uh, with a greater intensity. Uh, and um, there is, at least in some sports, a drive towards early specialization. Now, interestingly, one of my PhD students, uh, a sports medicine physician uh, from our group, Christine holm defended her PhD on the issue of early specialization only a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the model that she studied at the time was looking at uh, students at the age of 16 entering uh, sport specialized high schools, so an academic high school, but with a professional training program for the athletes where they train twice a day, 20 hours a week, that sort of thing. And the injury rate during that first year, so the transition into that program, was not different between the ones that had specialized early uh, or those who had specialized uh, later. Um, Still, um, I, I do think that it, it is uh, sensible um, from an injury prevention perspective to try to develop as many motor programs as you can during this golden age, as we, as we call it, uh, of the early teenage years. Um, so I do not think that it is a good idea to only play one sport um, during, that, uh, during that period of time. But we do not, there is really, there is zero data to actually uh, actually document that early single sport specialization puts you at greater risk um, than uh, an, a more rounded uh, multi-sport uh, program. Okay, Interestingly, what we do know from Norwegian data is that uh, 
if we look at our biggest stars, uh, so the gold medalists, the multiple gold medalists uh, of Norway, not looking at the injury part, but one of the things that uh, characterize them is that they trained a lot when they were young, but they participated in many sports much longer than some of the, of, of, of the, the athletes who never succeeded. This goes for our best alpine skiers and many of our top uh, athletes. Okay, thank you a lot. Uh, second question is, uh, four years ago, you published one interesting article. It's a uh, wide screening test to predict injury do not work and probably never will, critical mm -hmm. review. Uh, after four years, we are now here. Do you have the same opinion or something has changed? No, I certainly do have the same uh, opinion. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, the, the more data we get on the issue, uh, the more that data seem to confirm uh, the difficulty of using screening tests to predict the future. How to say on Norwegian, tak skal duha. Perfect, perfect. Pashogut. <laughs> Thank you for your answers. Well, uh, okay, thank you, Nicola, for the question. So uh, we also have the question from, from Professor Sasha Bowen, so from the uh, Faculty of Sports and Physical Education at NISH. So uh, Sasha, you can unmute your microphone and ask questions to Professor Barr. Hello. Hello. Uh, we cannot hear you, Sasha. Not, not yet. No, cannot hear you. Uh, if you cannot uh, connect with the microphone, maybe you can also type the uh, question in the chat section and I can read it to Professor. So you have uh, near uh, to the participant option, you have the chat option. Okay, we still cannot hear you. I mean, I cannot. Professor, you not? No, sorry, I cannot hear. No, still not. Uh, uh, I can hear something, but it, it cannot be understood. It's, uh, it is really too, too low in the intensity and we cannot understand. Okay, uh, so uh, you can type the question in the chat uh, section and we also have one more hand that is raised. It's from uh, Zoran Milanovic, so we can uh, answer his question while we wait for the Professor uh, Sasha. So uh, Zoran uh, is uh, also from the University of Nish. So Zoran, you can turn on your microphone and ask the question to Professor. Okay, hello. Uh -huh. Hello, are you hearing me? Yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for a nice presentation and thank you for organizing committee who provides such uh, presenters and uh, such lecture every week. I have one question related to uh, prediction of sports injury. Uh, I agree with the professor that screening methods uh, obviously doesn't work, doesn't work. Uh, because uh, injury is a very complex problem and the many screening methods are based on a simple approach. So my question is, uh, is there any chance for artificial intelligence uh, to identify risk of athletes' injuries? You show that you create a database with uh, daily data, so uh, uh, do you think that uh, using artificial intelligence, you can uh, increase uh, 
injury risk assessment? Thank you, Soren. Uh, great question again. Um, I think that uh, the limitation that we do have in sports medicine and sports science today is that the data that we're collecting on athletes uh, is, is, um, is not granular enough. Um, but I do think in a future um, where you can combine not just test data, but potentially also changes in test data, load data, sleep data, uh, wellness data um, into one large data set, um, then obviously the first step would then be to try and develop and, and, and validate the model uh, that, we, that we think can help us look into the future. Uh, we'll first develop and then as a second step, see if that uh, model can be validated in, uh, in future samples. So, so, whereas simple screening tests, usually then physical tests, cannot predict future injury, I, there's, there's certainly a possibility that when we get uh, complex or complete data sets of all aspects related to the athlete, that, that might change uh, or that that might pro provide tools that, that could be helpful. Yeah, uh, I agree uh, because uh, many uh, artificial intelligence is already used in many to identify different medical issues. So uh, I think that uh, we can also use it for injury prediction, but uh, we need uh, validation as you already mentioned. So thank you for your opinion. I have no more questions. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Zoran. So, uh, from Professor Bulban, can do we want that we try again, maybe? No, still cannot hear you. Okay, well, we are sorry for that. It's probably something with the, with your microphone. Maybe it's something blocked or not. Uh, okay, somebody else, maybe. Okay, uh, for now I don't have any hand that is raised. So I will ask you once again, say so if anybody wants to ask the question, okay, here is one hand. Uh, from Lana Karizman. She is a specialist uh, of sports medicine, so also one of uh, the our lab members. Okay, Lana, you can unmute your microphone and ask Professor a question you want. Okay, hello, Bila, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Okay. Uh, good day, Professor. Welcome to the Zoom platform. And hello to Professor Popovic and Professor Mazic also. Uh, thank you for your lecture. It was very interesting. Uh, first of all, I want to say I like your T-shirt, as, as good as I can see. Uh, I regret that I, ha that I um, wasn't be able to meet you in person uh, this March in Oslo when I had my final exam for IOC Sport Medicine Diploma course, but maybe luckily next year. So here's my question. I know that you work with all kinds of professional athletes, uh, especially on the prevention. But um, does this time of lockdown uh, been used to treat some, uh, for example, chronic injury to give them time uh, to treat, to heal more patiently, properly in their physiological pace? Uh, does some prevention strategy been made or uh, been treated some uh, uh, professional mm -hmm. athlete with that? So does this Corona time been used like a gift uh, positively maybe? That's all. Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a very precise comment uh, and 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 question. And certainly, we see this as a unique opportunity for um, tired bodies to heal. Um, and uh, um, if you think of the of the competition program that, for instance, our, our both our handball teams have been through uh, over the last year uh, with uh, 
with club matches, Champions League matches, uh, World Championship, European Championship uh, matches. Um, I, I, I think they were just very, very happy when the lockdown uh, happened. Um, and it's interesting when we, uh, I showed you how we monitor health among our athletes uh, through the weekly, uh, weekly app. And if I now go into our system, I can show you obviously, but I have a, if I have a look uh, myself, you will see that almost all the athletes are now green. Uh, so they're reporting that they're healthy. And uh, you remember the data, uh, typically one of three uh, has, uh, will report some sort of injury during, uh, during the time. Um, and uh, we're trying to ensure that they're, they're spending this time well, uh, working on their fitness, rehabbing injuries that, uh, that they haven't had time to rehab uh, during, the, during the busy uh, competition calendar. Um, so I do think uh, that for their bodies, this has been good. Uh, my concern, though, is when we restart. Because with the pressures, um, especially the financial pressures in some sports, such as football, to use one example, uh, the preparation time that uh, teams are likely to get from the first day of team uh, practice, when they do something resembling what they need to do uh, in a match, until the start of the season uh, is likely to be cut short uh, because there's so much money involved that leagues need to restart as quickly as they can. So maybe they only get four weeks or six weeks of preparation time before the, before the league starts. Uh, and I just read a tweet uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, I believe there were, uh, was it eight hamstring strains in six matches in the first weekend yeah. of the Bundesliga or was it the other way around six and eight matches? Eight. I, I don't remember. So that's not, um, so it doesn't really help uh, if you're not also given the time to ramp up the intensity of what you do to resemble the sport that you're actually going to be competing in before competitions resume. So that's my biggest concern. Okay, thank you, Professor. Okay, uh, thank you, Lana, for her question. Okay, uh, now once again, we have the uh, hand from Professor Sasha Bubin. Hello. Still not hearing you. <laughs> okay, so maybe we'll try later. Okay, now maybe. Hello. Uh, okay, uh, we also have here uh, Lazar Michita. He is uh, the student of uh, medicine on the final year, uh, but he is the volunteer at uh, one of uh, our orthopedic clinics. So, Lazar, you can turn on your microphone and ask Professor a question that you want. Uh, <clears throat> hello, good evening to everybody, especially Professor. Um, I have a lot of questions for you, but I will now uh, like, uh, first of all, to uh, say hello from uh, Vladimir Vanya Grbich. Uh, mm -hmm. He wanted to join uh, our session, but he has uh, some problems with microphones, so uh, unfortunately he couldn't. But um, he wants me to tell you to, uh, if, you, uh, if you are going to, go, to come to Serbia, uh, to say, uh, to, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, to go uh, uh, here you can uh, join us in our in his camp uh, for for volleyball this year. So you are invited. Um, I um, I uh, don't don't have much time and have problems with microphones. So I will now uh, let others uh, uh, let others speak and ask questions. Uh, I just wanted to say to say hello. Thank you. Thank you, Lazar. And this is a proper Serbian volleyball uh, shirt. And give my best regards to Vanya, please. Okay. Uh, so thank you, uh, Lazar, for uh, bringing uh, the salutes from, from Vanya Grbic. I think that I saw him that he was like only with uh, camera option, but now with microphone. So I suppose that he was able to hear uh, the the lecture because he was like here in uh, in the list of, of uh, participants. Uh, so uh, let me see. Yeah, uh, a lot of uh, positive comments on your T-shirt. So that you are in the 
official volleyball, Serbian volleyball um, dress. Okay. Uh, we have one more, uh, one more question from Milena Tomovic. Uh, she is uh, also the sports uh, medicine specialist uh, and she's currently in Thessaloniki. So Milena, uh, hello, and you can ask whatever you want to professor. Thank you, Vilja. Hello to everybody. Hello, Professor, again. I hope you're fine and that all of your family and you are safe in Nor Norway and that you enjoyed this period, that you, it was very fruitful for you. I would like to ask you the, if you are still performing periodic health evaluation at some point in your office. Um, I mean, the national teams, do you see them from time to time, maybe once a year? Yeah, well, we, uh, as I explained, we have, uh, thank you, Milena, it's good to see you again. Mm -hmm. um, as, I, as I described, uh, we used uh, the screening exam as the entry point into our program. Um, and then each team physician, in my case, that's our beach volleyball uh, team, it's a yeah, small team, but it's pretty good. Um, I see them approximately every six months uh, for a review. Um, and what we do then is that we do not do a full uh, physical examination or repeat all the testing that we do, uh, but it's basically a one hour conversation where we go through each player's individual data of injuries and illness during the past six months. We try to identify any current problems that they have, maybe niggling problems that they uh, haven't taken seriously or uh, that need extra attention. Um, so it's more of a, you could call it a periodic health evaluation, but it's more, so more around reviewing the detailed data that we have on each athlete um, and, uh, and a conversation around that than a full physical examination uh, like the one we do at the entry point, the screen, first screening exam. Okay, and uh, I would like to ask one more question, if it's okay with you. Bilja, is it okay? I hope, I think it's okay. Uh, uh, if the professor wants to answer, of course, it's, it's okay. Professor agrees. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you think that uh, we could call this method of yours telemedical continuous health uh, monitoring? And do you believe that this is reserved only for national athletes? And could we apply this to maybe some uh, specific teams? It's a good uh, yeah. We call it our screening and monitoring program. So that's very close to the wording that you use. So certainly. Um, and this, the monitoring is as important as the screening. Um, I think perhaps more important and especially the ability to have this data live and, and carry on a continuous conversation with the athletes around problems that they uh, that they must develop um, and certainly it can be applied to any team at uh, any level the software that we use is commercially available it's not we have no financial interest in this we simply work with a company that that has built this to our specifications on top of everything else that they offer um, so that's available to anyone at any level anywhere in the world. Uh, and uh, it's more a question of resources. Um, Definitely. Okay, thank you for your answers, Professor, and it's very nice to see you again. Well, uh, you, Milena. Mm. Well, thank you, Milena, for, for the questions. Uh, okay, uh, so for now, we don't have anything on chat, and uh, none of the hands is raised. So. One more shot to the audience, if somebody wants to, to ask a question. Uh, okay, we uh, to see Professor Sasha Rubin, maybe to try once again. Dale cannot hear you. <laughs> okay, so, uh, we, we, no, we, we cannot hear from Professor Rubin. So, uh, anybody else? Uh, no, no hand raised. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, if you allow me, Professor, I would like to ask a question or two. 
Uh, so, uh, as you already uh, mentioned in your presentation, so Norway uh, has become a leading country in uh, the world concerning the sports success if we put together uh, summer and winter Olympics, considering the number of the medals. So, uh, can you tell us uh, your opinion? So, what is the direct contribution of your Institute of Olympia Toppen in that? So, the organiza your organization and what you implement with those players, like from your point of view? Well, I guess we'd like to think that we have a contribution towards this uh, success. Um, others would have to be the judge of that. But I think uh, in some ways, this, the, the secret of the success, if you want to use that term, uh, is perhaps the smallness um, of the center. Okay. If you if you come there and you walk in the door, uh, you're not going to be very impressed at all. Um, but because it's small, it also puts the athletes uh, close together. <clears throat> These days, that's a problem because of the COVID pandemic. Yeah. Uh, but uh, normally, it's a big advantage having an alpine skier uh, standing next to a high jumper, standing next to a beach volleyball player in the, in the weight rack. Um, it's, so it's a, it's a little bit about creating a culture within those walls uh, where young athletes can come in and, and train side by side with world stars um, and, and from that learn what it takes um, to, to, reach, uh, to reach the top. Um, and I think perhaps in many ways that is the, the, the most important role that Olympia Toppen uh, serves. It's, it's as, a, as a meeting point and mingling point. What that also means is that unlike some of the bigger nations, when we go to the Olympics, everyone knows each other. Uh, so it's not like you're being introduced to your teammate on the flight or at the airport or to your doctor on the flight or the airport or to the support staff. Um, they're, they're, it's, it's integrated 365 days a year in that four, day, four year cycle of the Olympics. Uh, and I, I think that is also a, uh, a critical success factor in, in how we're set up. So sometimes it's good to be small. Well, yeah, yeah, it's like uh, some kind of uh, psychological contribution to, to their spirit. So being like maybe train and be near your idol. And then once again, when they all together go on the competition, it's like one family going. Uh, to fight against the world. Uh, okay, we have from Professor Nebuša Popović the hand that is raised. Hello, Professor, uh, join us and uh, and uh, share with us. Share your with us your... Uh, hello, uh, Raul. Thank you very much uh, to participate on the Belgrade Sports Medicine meeting. That uh, I think that uh, you are very satisfied how we are uh, managing it, and I have. Uh, a question. You told us there is 34% uh, of 34% uh, of uh, uh, injury, uh, 34 days per year lost because of injury or illness. Do you uh, have an impression that is going, this number are going down or going up uh, year after year? Well, over. Thank you. Good question, and good to see you uh, again. Uh, next time, perhaps in person and not over the internet. Um, and thank you for for setting this up. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, the data that we have now goes back uh, to uh, the 2012 London Games, so the preparation period. Uh, so that's 2010. So we have 10 years of of data. Um, and I, I would say, un unfortunately, it doesn't really look like this number is changing. It's been pretty stable over each of the Olympic cycles that we have uh, monitored uh, the athletes closely. Um, so the question then is obviously, are we not doing a good enough job? Uh, should we be doing better in reducing uh, or preventing injury and illness in the team? But on the other hand, you could perhaps say that, well, now athletes train even harder than they did eight years ago. So keeping that number at the same level is, is, is maybe a measure of, uh, of success. But it is 
for you know, I know everyone who's, who's watching and, and listening to this now are working in sports medicine. And if you ever need an argument uh, to justify an investment in sports medicine support uh, and preventive work, um, even in our reasonably successful program, on average, as you say, the athletes lose one month of training every year where they do not train at all. So that's one month lost. Imagine if you could take that away and train continuously at the level you want to, what success you could you could have. Um, and, and I think perhaps, I, I don't think that we are unique in that. I don't think Norway is unique in that. Uh, uh, having you as our guest, I would like to explain to my younger colleagues in Serbia, because in sports medicine, you know, uh, we had lots of opinion but we didn't have a fact. And uh, Roald with his team for the years working hard, he established that this opinion become the facts and that needs serious study. And he is uh, somebody who managed that, who learned lots of people around the world and uh, now we have much better data. But if we want to progress in the prevention of injury and so on, we have to work together because the data of one country is not enough to do, to go forward. And we have to have a unique platform where we can collaborate on the role level. Do you agree, Rob? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I can just say fully agree. What we need is international collaboration uh, on sports. But still, we have to remember that sports medicine is a young field. Um, we maybe have a history of, uh, of real science being done in sports medicine over the last 20 years, maybe 10 years, uh, which means that uh, there are so many questions that we think have been answered, but they haven't really been answered properly. And there are so many que uh, questions that have never been answered uh, that really need study. Um, so I think there, there's an enormous potential uh, for uh, international work and international collaboration to try to address some of these. And I would uh, encourage everyone who is uh, young and younger than me and keen uh, on going into to sports science, sports medicine, to pursue that path. And uh, Rob, one thing that you didn't know about Serbia. Mm -hmm. And I know that you will spend a few times there, you have lots of friends. And uh, this year, uh, Faculty of Medicine in Belgrade uh, in December is going to have 100 years of existence and 75 years of, of existence of uh, sports medicine at, uh, officially at the Faculty of Medicine. That's uh, really rare. Uh, so long tradition of sports medicine in, in uh, one uh, European country. You are getting 75 years. That's, oh, that's remarkable. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, so thank you, uh, Professor uh, Popovic, for uh, getting with us here and, and asking questions. Uh, so let me see if uh, there is uh, somebody else. And uh, until giving time to people to uh, think, I would like also to uh, say a special hello to Professor uh, Milanko from uh, Novi Sad, uh, who is uh, one of the leading uh, mm -hmm. uh, orthopedic surgeons uh, for the knee injury and ACL injury, and also the member of uh, multiple uh, sport orthopedic uh, association. Mm -hmm. So uh, one special hello to, to Professor Milanko for joining us uh, today. Uh, so, uh, Professor Barr, there is a really uh, huge amount of positive comments about uh, you wearing the uh, volleyball, the t-shirt of our team. Uh, so, we are really happy that uh, the members of uh, Serbia Volleyball Federation and uh, it's a great honor for us that you uh, managed to find some time and uh, join us here in this uh, forum so that uh, we can hear uh, some new recommendation on the field of uh, screening, uh, monitoring and prevention in sports medicine. And this is actually the first uh, webinar in this uh, e-forum that was uh, on that topic. So I think that 
was the reason why a lot of uh, participants uh, uh, actually wanted to ask uh, you questions directly. So let me see to check once again. So nothing on chat and uh, there is no raised hand. Uh, so uh, I will thank you once again in front of the entire uh, team of uh, Belgrade Sports Medicine e Forum for joining us. And I would like to call everybody for the next week uh, lecture that will be uh, given by Professor Marco Cardinale, who is the Executive Director uh, of Research and Scientific Support uh, at Aspeter Clinic. The topic of the lecture will be sports science in the high performance sport, uh, doing uh, 100 things 1% better. So from some practical field, we will move more to a scientific approach uh, to the sports medicine. So uh, thank, uh, thank you once again, Professor, and all the audience for uh, taking some time and joining this lecture today. Thank you very much. Greetings um, from Norway. Greetings from Norway. Bye. Bye-bye.